Hey everybody, thank you very much for joining me for another episode of the Knowledge and Mileage podcast. Again, a very special episode because we've got a very special guest. And that special guest, let me see if I can get the pronunciation right, is Jasmina Agonovic. Did I do that right? You got it. You Boom. got it. Good job. <laughs> Straight out of the park. So uh, you are a scientist, a cosmetics expert, and the president of Mother Dirt. Have I missed anything there? I'm sure there's a, there's quite a few to add there. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got it. Okay, I got it. So uh, let's start about that. So let, let's talk about Mother Dirt. Let's get straight into it. So um, I'm sure some people would have noticed like on my socials, like going back over a year ago when uh, I first tried your products. And uh, because like I, I'm somebody that really looks, uh, takes a deep dive into the microbiome. And I try to learn as much as I could about the microbiome, you know, of course, uh, within the gut, we're still just scratching the surface of how right. it can control our immunity, our sleep, our uh, mental pathways, our physical outputs, everything. You know, I, I call it my primary brain as opposed to the secondary brain. But then I started taking a bit of a dive on another ecosystem on our skin, the microbiome. Yeah. Uh, there as well and that's when i came across your products and uh so for me to actually now be here sat in front of you and uh you know interrogate you for a little uh. while for the listeners is going to be absolutely awesome so of course we always hear that you know you should be hygienic you should be clean uh to make sure that you don't get any bacteria or any diseases mm -hmm. so bacteria has really got itself a bad rap why yep. do you think that is so and why do you think we should be making the change and the switch to say, well, it isn't all negative. There's a lot of positives there. Yeah, um, well, certainly that's a loaded question and a really important one, uh, which makes that a great starting point for our for our conversation. You know, this this idea of cleanliness uh, is a really interesting thing to study from an anthropological standpoint. Uh, so much of our current conventions and beliefs are rooted part in religion, believe it or not. So how different religions evolved over many hundreds and thousands of years, what we believe to be pure and clean versus what we believe to be dirty in, in some sense is grounded in that. And then the other part of it has to do with the germ theory of disease, right? The, the first connection point to a bacteria that caused a disease that led to bacteria is bad, it's harmful, it will make us sick. That ended up being sort of the baseline platform of the medical community's belief around cleanliness that comes with that comes with health. The big shift that has been happening over the course of the last, in particular, the last decade, is the understanding that the bacteria that we know of that are harmful, there's maybe only 400 of them, but there are actually hundreds of millions of bacteria that we have no idea what they do. And so suddenly we find ourselves having misju misjudged this entire taxa as something that is really harmful when in fact we probably need to recalibrate, right? We probably need to revisit and start to reshift our, our view. Got it. All right. So th this thought, you know, like we said, in, in regards to the bacteria, we're always thinking, especially of kids in this day and age, you know, don't go out and play in the dirt, you know, stay indoors, <laughs> you'll get yourself uh, some sort of disease. Where should we be encouraging ourselves and our children to, you know, I'm not saying to go out there and be unhygienic, but go out there and, you know, because there is bacteria within the soil that we do not have uh, within ourselves as much now. You know, can you talk a little bit about that? Because wherever I travel to, I always try to find, a, you know, I'll get to my hotel, I'll look outside, where's the grassy patch? Okay, there's a beach <laughs> there, there's a park there. Number one, yeah. because depends if I've traveled internationally, I'm trying to ground myself, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I know that I'm exposed to a lot of uh, EMF rays and I want to pick up, you know, some good bacteria. I grew up on a farm, so I'm fine. I can walk yeah. around on that stuff and my immune system's pretty strong. Is this something that you encourage? Uh, do you have children yourself? I don't have kids, uh, but we do get this question a lot around what the right type of hygiene is. And again, it comes back to the recalibration and not complete reversal. And so I really like the fact that you said, you know, we're not trying to tell people to be 
unhygienic. We're not trying to tell people to stop washing their hands and to stop participating in, in basic hygiene practices. But it is about starting to revisit how much our lifestyles have changed. And so in the case of children playing outdoors, this is a really poignant one, because if you look back just one generation ago, kids used to spend a lot more time outdoors than they do currently. And this in a microcosm is a really good example of how rapidly our lifestyles have evolved, spending less and less time from the outdoors, spending more and more time indoors. We've effectively separated ourselves and removed ourselves from nature, thinking that it would be fine and that we would still be okay but what we're realizing is that nature is a critical participant potentially in our health and our well-being and that having a, a healthy <laughs> connection to it is actually pretty pretty crucial. Um, so to answer your question, you know whether whether or not we should encourage our kids to play outdoors more than they do now, the answer is overwhelmingly yes. Uh, and there are more and more brands that are actually starting to harp on this message. Uh, Nature Valley did a really interesting series of ads around the time spent outdoors and really encouraging people to spend more time outdoors. Um, so it's a, it's a set of commercials that I've personally really enjoyed because it overlaps with some of the key values and messages that we have as a brand. Um, but, you know, a long way of really saying, yeah, we should all probably be spending a lot more time outdoors. Okay, so what is it, what are, what are the components of the bacteria that is found uh, within the soil that we just cannot get uh, through supplementation or diet or anything like that? Or is there a way? Yeah. So it's important to start off by saying that our internal ecosystem is vastly different from our uh, topical ecosystem. And some people think, you know, we... Uh, we're born with a certain type of microbiome, but it's really important to point out that the microbiome is dynamic and that we accumulate it over the course of our lifetime. Most of what we gather uh, for our microbiome does happen in the early stages of, of our life in the first several nascent influential years, which is why, again, it's really important um, for, for kids and parents to be thinking about this. But the microbiome is seeded from the mother and also from the environment, the things that we start to start to interact with. Um, so some of the digestive pieces are going to come from from the mother. They're also going to come from the food that we eat. Um, and those are not the same types of bacteria that we would get from our natural environment. And the reasoning for that is because the environment on our skin is very different than the environment internally. What our skin needs to be doing is very different from what our digestive system needs to be doing. And if you think about how we as human beings evolved, we evolved interacting with the outdoors a whole lot more. And so we've developed through our topical microbiome and our internal microbiome uh, sort of an ecosystem that depends off of nature in some sort of capacity. And if we disconnect ourselves by introducing, um, you know, antibacterial products or antibiotics, um, prescribe, over-prescribing antibiotics and other forms of separation from the natural environment, we're starting to remove certain types of bacteria that could potentially be critical to, to our health um, and to how we look and feel. Okay, so is that, uh, does that go for the fact as well, especially the females using a lot of uh, uh, makeup and then makeup remover, and there's a lot of skin products out there now that have a lot of, uh, let's say, contaminants that do not have uh, a positive effect on you. Would you say that we're being stripped of a lot of the bacteria, not just from the air conditioning and stuff like mm -hmm. that, but from the actual products that we're using? Uh, yes, uh, there's a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that we may have lost a certain portion of the diversity that's on our skin from two things. One, you've already mentioned, so the products that we use and we've introduced in, uh, into our day to day. And then the second is actually the lack of interaction with the outdoors, which we've already already talked about. And one of the things that I want to point out about the products that we use on a day to day basis there's a few different gradients for this. So there's like participating in basic hygiene practices, um, you know, showering, using soap and things like that. Uh, there are components in soap that definitely are toxic to certain types of good bacteria on the skin, especially the one that we look at. Um, but then there's this level of hygiene that's been introduced, particularly in very developed countries that is very focused on antibacterial benefits. Um, so antibacterial this, antibacterial that. 
And that definitely we want to have a discourse on because there's actually very little evidence indicating that products labeled as antibacterial used on a daily, regular basis is actually more effective than plain soap and water. It's, there's not. There's no evidence indicating that to be the case. And if anything, there's concerns about it being higher risk. So for an adjustment on, on the hygiene front, there's no need to be that excessive with the products that you're, that you're using. And then from there, there's a whole other conversation about potentially the excessive amount of products that we're using, potentially the chemistry that's in these products and how they're affecting this new organ system that we've just discovered. Uh, there's a whole other conversation to be had around preservatives um, and things along those lines. So, you know, when that question is asked about products and how they interact with our skin, what impact is it having? There are so many really interesting layers to, to that conversation. Okay, yeah, that is interesting. I've got another layer for you, uh, and that is because a lot of the listeners uh, listening to this podcast right now are fitness enthusiasts. So they're mm -hmm. possibly hitting cardio in the morning, having a shower, maybe possibly doing a class at lunchtime, having a shower, then in the evening, doing their second mm -hmm. cardio or their CrossFit class, and then having a shower. Are these people going to be at a more detrimental effect uh, to be exposed to the area of saying basically having no healthy bacteria on their skin because the excessive washing and excessive antibacterial soaps that are marketed towards fitness enthusiasts. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because bacteria is smelly, right? I'm going to put that in quotations because not all bacteria is actually smelly, but that's one of the so basically it's like shower, otherwise you will be perceived as disgusting and you will smell. That's like the subliminal message that's sent to us. So to answer your question, it all depends on actually what they're doing in their showers. So plain water is not harmful. And actually, and I'll challenge some of the listeners to this, taking a water only shower, you might be surprised at how effective it is actually. Um, and then the other level to this, um, and, and I won't get too much into it, but the reason we have a lot of people in the fitness world who use uh, our mist in particular is because it removes the irritating components of the sweat and it converts it into beneficial byproducts that has a rebalancing effect on the skin. So our users in particular really find that they can cut out those midday showers because they actually feel cleaner or that they can go to just taking water only showers if they were you know, afraid of doing that before. Their showers are quicker. Their showers are easier. They find that they still feel clean. They don't have to worry about some of those things that you might be afraid would happen. There's, you know, no smell, no odor. You still feel fresh and clean, but it's a very different way to be able to approach it. Um, so that is a very specific way to address that. But try a water only shower. See how fresh they feel. If they are lathering up head to toe in soap multiple times a day, I would be really interested to see how many of them feel like they have typically drier skin or are dealing with a skin issue. Um, because certainly in scenarios like that, by constant exposure to surfactants in particular, you are uh, potentially having an effect on your lipid bilayer of your skin, but you're definitely also having an, an effect on th that skin's ecosystem, which is likely leaving it uh, more susceptible to some sort of, of an issue. So it all really depends on what they're doing uh, in that shower. <laughs> right. And uh, as being you know, a fitness enthusiast, a lot of my followers are into bodybuilding, not necessarily competitive bodybuilding, but they want to transform their bodies. They want to build up their strength, their bone density, etc. And a lot of it comes from a van vanitarial point of view, even though I do try to primary uh, get people to focus on their mm -hmm. internal health. We all want to look good. We all want to look yep. great. You know, as we get older, I want to protect uh, my hearing. So I've got my headphones down rather than low. I yeah. protect my eyes, uh, uh, particularly from a lot of uh, blue light exposure. Uh, I, I want them uh, mm -hmm. when I'm 80, 90, 100 years old, but I want to look good at the same time as feeling good. So speaking of the mist that you uh, just discussed, I, I know about the mist. I, I, I've been using it for over a year now. What can a user expect? And if somebody has been exposed to, you know, maybe they live on a farm, so mm -hmm. they're closer to the, the natural ecosystem out there, should they be using a mist? Should everyone be using a mist? How often? And what would the effects be that they see? For me, I felt that I had, uh, within a few weeks, my, my skin tone was better. I'd say that was the mm -hmm. majority. But what, 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 what's your POV on that? 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm certainly not going to, um, you know, tell everyone that they absolutely should be using uh, should be using the mist. I am a big believer that things are, uh, you know, personal decisions for folks. Uh, I think that there's a point to be made about people who naturally spend a lot more time outdoors and live a healthier lifestyle in general versus spending a lot of time in an urban environment indoors, probably don't spend as much time uh, outdoors. I, I think that there's definitely an argument to be made about one of those groups, the urban group, probably uh, could benefit more from the mist purely from a healthy lifestyle and exposure standpoint. Um, in terms of what what would be noticed, so for for folks, I'll say about half of our users have some sort of an ongoing issue with their skin. So they either have an oily skin issue or a dry skin issue or a sensitive skin issue. Our bacteria is called the peacekeeper bacteria. It once used to exist on our skin. It comes from the soil. So if you think about how we evolved as humans, we were much more immersed in the natural environment. The walking barefoot and grounding, as you were talking about, this would naturally expose you to this bacteria. Swimming in lakes and rivers and streams would also naturally expose us to that uh, bacteria, but we don't do that that much these days. Um, so if you think about uh, how we evolved, uh, this is how we were exposed to this bacteria. And research, uh, not even by our group, has indicated the importance of this bacteria in nature, as well as in other nitrogen systems uh, or nitrogen cycles, one of which is, is on our skin. So its importance is very uh, relevant to the skin uh, in having and promoting a balancing effect. So unlike other products that you might use on your skin where they would say, oh, if you have dry skin, then use product A. If you have oily skin, use product B and so on and so forth. Ours isn't really about that. It's about bringing everything into balance. So if you do have oily or dry or sensitive skin, you will notice that your skin is either uh, looks and feels less oily, less dry, less sensitive. Um, so those are some of the perceptible benefits. There's a really interesting aspect to our product as well that also goes back to this idea of balance and a little bit of what we were talking about before, which is uh, reducing our chemical exposure in some way. So because people find that their skin looks better and feels better, they find that they are able to cut down on the products in their routines. And this is important to them, not only because of their own health, but because of environmental impact as well, potentially simplifying their routine, um, a good example of this is deodorant. Um, uh, so about 60% of our users are able to cut down or cut out uh, deodorant from their routine. Uh, so, you know, that's, a, that's also an interesting um, uh, benefit that comes along with this idea of, uh, of balance on the skin. Got it. Okay. So for the listeners out there now, they are wondering, okay, what should I be doing for my skin? How often should I be e even using a soap? Like uh, I had uh, that aha moment when I was looking into a lot of the chemicals and uh, impurities that are found in a lot of uh, lotions and eye creams and day creams and night creams and SPFs yep. and all that stuff. And I, the first app I downloaded, I think it was called the Think Dirty app. Yes. And uh -huh. I remember uh, being a, you know, like scanning everything on this app around my bath of all the cleaning products. And one could be like higher uh, cancerogenic, you know, another one could be higher that could promote skin issues. And I was like, wow, shock. And next mm. thing, my trash can was full of all these products and I kind of started again and that's how I came across uh, Mother Dirt. So how would people know that the products that they're using right now could be, instead of healing them, harming them? And what mm. would their protocol be moving forward if anti-aging is one of the perspectives that you want to focus on? Sure. So I'll start off by saying that this is an extremely important topic and also one that is really complicated. It's complicated both from the scientific perspective because there are currently no good models to fully understand the end-to-end -end impact of certain types of chemistry or chemicals on the human body and the environment. It's so complex and it's so multifaceted. Um, and it's also complicated from a regulatory standpoint. Um, and I say that as sort of like a diplomatic um, opening to the fact that um, it's an important topic. It's something that I believe firmly in. I think that there's a lot of science that still needs to go into properly validating safety around ingredients before we start to get really terrified. That being said, 
there's a lot of work that needs to be done already. There's some, you know, really phenomenal data around ingredients that we already should be cutting out of our routines. And there are some good resources that either listeners of this podcast or people in general can access to start to edit um, their routine. So I'm glad that you accessed that app. I think that that is fantastic. I think that that's a good resource that people can certainly um, start to uh, start to use and start to leverage. Um, but all of this sort of awkward long tirade is just emphasizing that um, start to make the right moves for you and start to ask the right questions. Um, try not to be terrified into making decisions, though, because you know, I view consumers as being actually a very vulnerable group. And unfortunately, I see information in the industry swing them from one pendulum to the other. Um, and it's just really important to be self-aware and mindful and very deliberate about the information that you choose to absorb. So there are lots of resources out there. And I'm actually happy to email you some afterwards. In addition to Think Dirty, there are some organizations that are doing really good work around ingredients and toxicity and where some of the gray area and, um, and challenges are. Um, I'll also add that earlier this week I was at Simmons College and they were teaching a toxic chem uh, chemicals um, class as well. So it was very exciting for me to see college students learning about this subject because it's so important and there are not classes being taught on this. Um, it wasn't there when I was in college and it's becoming increasingly important and gives me hope that young people are interested in the, in the topic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so sure. now. So now to finally answer your question around what, what people can do. So if you are interested in doing a full-on um, purge of your, of your products or a full-on evaluation of your products, um, definitely access tools like the Think Dirty app, uh, the EWG database. Some people have also find, found that that's useful. And that can start to give you a rating system of some of the ingredients that are in your products. Um, separately from that, I would encourage listeners to cultivate a level of self-awareness around the products that they're using and why they're using. You would be surprised to find out how many products we use, not because we actually need them, but because we've somehow been preconditioned throughout the course of our lives to think that we have to use them. Uh, and so having just that um, level of self-awareness is very important. The number of people who don't actually have to use deodorant but still do is really interesting. The percentage is more than 50% of people actually use deodorant when they don't actually have to. Um, uh, and that also translates into your routine. So when you're in the shower, do you lather, rinse, and repeat with the shampoo in your hair? If you do, should you? Do you actually need to lather, rinse, and repeat for your hair to feel clean? Do you actually need to wash your hair every single day or can you start to skip a few days? Uh, do you need to lather up head to toe or maybe can you just focus on critical areas? Little thoughts like that can actually make a very meaningful difference when you accumulate it over, over the course of time. And they can be really empowering steps that feel less daunting than doing a complete uh, routine overhaul. Got it. All right. Interesting. Fascinating. So uh, that, talk, can you talk us a little bit about your mist? Uh, for sure. instance, because I, I just think that's a that's a that's a fascinating product. I don't want to I don't want this uh, podcast to sound like it's all about uh, product, but I just think this is a fascinating product in itself. Because you know when it, it came to me, like I said, I ordered it over a year ago initially, and it said, "Wow, you've got to keep this in a fridge," and yeah, you know, you've got to use it within this certain amount of time. If it's not in the fridge, I thought, "Wow, this is a live culture that I'm dealing with here that I, I'm, I'm I'm putting on my skin here." Now, you have other uh, products as well, like the shampoo. By the way, I actually use this shampoo on my dog's head as well. Because oh, yeah? <laughs> when I, when <laughs> I wash his, his head, I just want to make sure that I'm not getting it in his eyes and all that sure. sort of stuff. The rest of his body is, 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 you know, I still have a natural product, but I know that's yeah. good on his, on his head, you know. Uh, yeah. But with the mist, you've got a live culture there. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it has to be refrigerated. Like, for instance, I got a question just on that point. Like, yep. I have a large international following. Like, do you send it overseas? And how is it kind of kept stable in order for somebody to receive it? Yeah, good, good. All really great questions. Um, this was one of the reasons that it actually took us about a year to figure out the manufacturing and the logistics around what it would actually take to make this into a viable consumer product business. Because Mother Dirt was not actually part of the original plan for the company or the business. It was um, a little bit of coincidence, definitely a little bit of luck. 
but a lot more interest from the public than we had expected. And so, yes, it's a little bit weird to have a discussion about a, a product in a venue like this, but actually we were very deliberate in starting a brand because we knew that the brand would be a very powerful vehicle to have a discussion about public health and this shift that's really important. Because until you have something physical that people can interact with, it's gonna stay words on a page and it's just gonna be philosophical. But if you interact with it like you did, it really starts to change the way you think about certain things in a much more powerful way than words on a page. Words on a page are meaningful up until a certain point, but when you hold it in your hand, spray it, feel it, see that it doesn't smell, see that it actually creates good things for your skin, you start to create a really powerful, um, powerful pivot. So the mist, um, it comes from, um, we culture the bacteria from the soil. Uh, the bacteria plays a really important role in the nitrogen cycle of nature and on, and on the skin. Um, we lost this bacteria we think about as recently as the last hundred years. And the way that we founded the company was actually to do clinical trials on inflammatory skin diseases. The reason we ended up starting the consumer facing side ended up being because of something that we didn't expect to happen. Uh, we did an early stage cosmetic clinical study where we had 30 people abandon their modern personal care products, uh, spray themselves with, uh, take water only showers and then spray themselves with this bacteria twice a day. And then we swabbed and sequenced their skin microbiome as it shifted over the course of that study or to measure whether or not it would shift or change and to see if the bacteria would re-engraft on their skin. Uh, and then we also uh, measured perceived differences. So how did the skin start to change in terms of how it looked and feel, felt? Uh, one of the participants in the study ended up writing about her experience, and this story was published in the New York Times. It ended up being the most circulated article for one month. It was in the top five. Uh, and it's actually a very funny, uh, good read. Um, it's It has a cheeky name. Um, so it was 2014 that this article came out. And it's called the My No Soap, No Shampoo Bacteria Rich Hygiene Experiment. That's that's what it's called. Um, and this, the the wide circulation of this let us know that the it was not just uh, like microbiome nerds or academics that were interested in the prospect of the research that we were doing, that the general public was, uh, you know, both struggling with health and skeptical of conventional approaches and that this was creating this interest in an entirely new approach, but also a, an approach that potentially explains why other things haven't, haven't worked in the, in the past. So when we did decide to launch a brand around this really as a vehicle to continue this conversation with the public, we did need to figure things out like how do you fill it into a bottle and ship it to people. Um, we needed to do a series of stability studies. We needed to do shipping studies. Uh, we do need to package the product in specific ways. And there's a lot of cost that goes into it, into that from our end to ensure that the product, when it arrives, it's alive and potent. When it arrives, it's not supposed to be cold per se. It's not expected to be cold, but all of the insulation that arrives with it is expected to just protect the bacteria from, from extremes. But we do ship internationally, um, and we got to ship it quickly. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Interesting. So, uh, and, and, and is there, have you found that there is a correlation? Because I found it interesting when you mentioned about, you know, different skin issues that people mm -hmm. have. And uh, I come from a family of asthmatics on my father's side. And uh, a couple of my cousins, me, not so much, but I, I used to have asthma uh, quite bad. Uh, not anymore. Um, you know, I think it's because I started taking care of uh, my gut, uh, mm. obviously my health from various perspectives. Um, I do expose myself to a lot of uh, different types of micro uh, uh, bacteria outdoors. I do triathlon training, so right. you should see the state of some of the lakes I go swimming in around here, you know. But maybe it builds Amazing. up my immune system. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but, but with that, so... so 
and I, I'm always going to kind of go off on a bit of a tangent here because I'm thinking of so many things. Speaking of triathletes, like I see a lot of these guys super fit. However, I see what they look like 10 years ago to today. It's like, wow, what happened? Because they mm. are exposed to sun and sun damage so much because they're cycling outdoors, they're running outdoors, they're swimming outdoors. So they tend to age rather quickly. Yeah. Um, is there a healthy sort of protectant that people can use? And is it okay for that to kind of sit on the skin? And does the mist actually help in regards to that uh, protectant at all? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't have a definitive answer to that other than the fact that this reinforces, um, you know, the damage over time that the, the sun can do. Um, certainly the sun has benefits in helping us with our vitamin D production, but for people who are persistently and constantly outdoors, it's, it's to this whole new level. Uh, they just have to wear SPF, which I know for athletes is, is definitely a big challenge. And I know that there are not a ton of formulas out there that feel like they do well in being sweat proof and waterproof and not irritating to the skin. So I, I don't have a good answer there. Um, other than the fact that I just recognize how much of an issue it certainly is. And the sun certainly is one of the biggest contributing factors to, to aging. Got it. Right. Okay. Well, going back to the, my other thoughts anyway, in regards to the eczema and asthma. So, yeah. you know, my couple of my cousins had the same. Um, so does that go to show because I fixed my gut microbiome to a certain degree, and then I alleviated myself of the symptoms of asthma. Asthma. Does that mean that there is a correlation between the gut microbiome and the skin microbiome, where there could be a correlation here? Asthmatics get in eczema more than more than not. Yeah. So I. Um, so I'll start off by saying that Mother Dirt is a cosmetic product in line, and I'm a chemical and biological engineer. And so what I'm I'm speaking to is just driven by my observations in the industry, not because I'm a medical medical doctor or anything like that. Um, what I think you're highlighting actually is the reason why a lot of people are very excited about the potential of the microbiome, because it introduces a new prospect in understanding these highly complex diseases that we have not yet been able to solve. Is there a known link between the skin microbiome and the gut microbiome? No, we don't know for sure. But what I can say is that we don't know where the skin microbiome ends and the gut microbiome begins. You know, does the skin microbiome end here or does it end there? And then the gut microbiome start here or end there. So it all blends together. Uh, and I am sure that it is working together synergistically in very highly complex ways that we don't yet understand. But in seeking that understanding, I think that we will have a lot of really rich answers that will give us many more levers to pull to help us uh, make an impact on, on diseases like this. So there are a couple companies that are working on something really interesting and, and uh, that touch on this question. And, and I will um, bring them up in just a moment. But one interesting statistic that will really give you pause is how closely eczema and asthma track. So I think if a child, pediatric eczema, if a child has eczema, 80% of children that have eczema have asthma. Wow. Isn't that fascinating? Very fascinating. So that begs the question of, huh, why are these tracking so closely? And so a lot of scientists look at that as a very, very interesting piece of data that, you know, causation and correlation need to be need to be understood. So there are a couple companies that are working on some really interesting uh, work. There's a group out of UC Davis that has spun out a company called Avivo. And they are uh, they have created a probiotic using B and Fantis bacteria. Uh, that mothers can mix into breast milk or formula. And what's very interesting about this bacteria is similar to the bacteria in our mist, it has vanished in the last hundred years from breast milk. So where uh, infants would get this before would be through breast milk. However, the pervasive use of antibiotics, which antibiotics are important because they save our lives, but overuse of antibiotics obviously is a whole other thing and really the issue that we're talking about um, the pervasive use of antibiotics has removed uh, B. infantis from many modern uh, humans, which has prevented B. infantis from being passed down. And when it's not passed down, it can't be passed down through generations. So they've looked at really interesting studies that show how baby poop has changed in the last hundred years 
and they are really interested in this because they want to know if restoring B. infantis will help improve health outcomes for children, basically reduce the likelihood that they might have everything from eczema to um, eczema to asthma, uh, along with a whole host of, of other issues that have become uh, inflammation related and have an increased incidence of, of early onset, particularly in, in children. So that's one group that's doing really interesting work. And then another group is based right here out of uh, Boston, and they're called Commence. And what they're doing is they're studying uh, bacteria that comes from the mother and specifically how mothers seed the microbiome of children. What they, the future vision that they would like to paint is whether or not they could identify how they could seed an infant's gut microbiome in a way that could put them on a good track. So would it be possible one day that when a child is born, we immediately sequence their gut microbiome and identify that they are predisposed to X, Y, and Z and immediately start supplementing so that they can course correct very quickly early on uh, so that they no longer are predisposed to those types of issues. So very, very futuristic thinking, but just really fascinating work that's being done and will be very interesting to see uh, how they evolve and uh, potentially how maybe the next generation actually is uh, embracing bacteria for the treatment of certain diseases. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, like, like I find that my immune system is very, very good. I used to, I, I do a lot of video programs. So on my video trainers, I'm your training partner, I'm your coach, et cetera, et cetera. You watch a video every single day if you're on a fat loss program, muscle building, transformation, performance such as uh, Iron Man, et cetera. Uh, but what I used to find is that I would, especially if I went into a calorie deficit, within the first couple of weeks, I'd come down with some sort of sickness, you know, sickness like a cold, Interesting. something like that. But uh, ever since I started focusing on bacteria being a positive piece in my armory, I haven't got sick for years and years. I'd say it's probably about four, maybe five years since I've had any any type of sickness. And like I said, you know, I still make sure that I get out of the, into the earth. I've got my chickens I can see out here. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, uh, we uh, you know, have our own herbs here. And, you know, in, in the summer, we'll have some fruit and, you know, strawberries and stuff, you know, because I try to stay close. And obviously, if I'm uh, preparing for an Ironman, I'm here in Boise, Idaho. I'm in nature a lot. Um, I'm wondering if that is helping with my immune system now because I'm all, always outdoors and I try to stay out, outdoors as much as I possibly can and trying to control my environment internally as well. is uh, is very uh, interesting that you said about antibiotics as well because not only do we have to look at the antibiotic consumption that we may get prescribed at a doctor's, like you said, it could save our lives, but whenever possible, I do try to shy away from it. Uh, do you have a concern as well of the antibiotics in foods as well, farmed foods? Because I always say it's not just the antibiotics that could be exposed that you eat, but the food that you eat ate. And yeah. around 70% of the antibiotics in the world consumed are by animals and not humans. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I um, am not as familiar with um, the, the world of farming and um, how antibiotics impact livestock, but uh, I've been watching this show. Um, it's a documentary series on Netflix called uh, Chef's Table, and essentially each episode is filmed very documentary style about a given chef. And so many of these, I, virtually every single one of them has such an immense appreciation for the land and for animals and how they're raised. And the philosophy that comes across is, it's not just that you are what you eat, you are what you are eating ate too, right? Like it, it, it goes down that way. So, you know, you asked a lot of really good questions and I, I, I the answer is yes to all of them. It, it matters uh, how we treat uh, our animals and what they're eating as well. It matters what we're eating from the environment. Um, is spending more time outside better for us it is. We don't really understand exactly what the mechanism is, but it, it appears to be there's so much evidence that points to it and we can't, you know, pin down the specific pathway for it. 
but there's a lot of strong evidence pointing to uh, the overwhelming answer being yes to, to all of those. Yeah, there's so many components to it. I do understand, you know, for instance, if I'm outdoors, I find it very meditative. You know, I, yeah. I'm not one that can actually sit in a room all the time and go into meditation. But if I go for a, a run in the trails, then that's my active meditation. So if it's going to affect you mentally in a positive aspect, obviously, it's going to have a great physiological uh, sort of effect on right. you as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So just one more thing here. Now, one thing that I really liked about on the website, you have the peacekeeper uh, written on there. I love that statement because I'm just trying to paint a picture for the listeners here. Uh, when I think of my gut microbiome, you know, there's we're trying to keep our head af afloat. You know, there's the pesticides, the herbicides, the antibiotics, et cetera, ge genetically modified food. And that peacekeeper, I believe, would be like the goat's kefir, the probiotics, mm. trying to have humane raised and organic and your kimchi and your sauerkraut and your probiotics. Now, would you say that's what you have now with your products being the peacekeeper to the elements that we're exposed to today? Yes, that's one way to look at it. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a history around why it became uh, the peacekeeper bacteria. So the, this bacteria is known as a really crucial piece in nature of, of the nitrogen cycle. So I'll, I'll go a little bit technical here. Um, in any given nitrogen cycle that is happening in nature all the time, you have toxic buildup that's being produced. And then that toxic buildup has to be reprocessed, reconsumed, and recycled back into useful things for the environment. What this toxic buildup typically is, is ammonia, which is uh, basic, it's irritating, it's toxic. At this top step here is this class of bacteria, our peacekeeper bacteria. It is constantly taking that irritating stuff and it is converting it back into useful things for nature and for the environment. When you remove that bacteria, you get a bunch of toxic buildup in the environment and that ecosystem starts to, starts to struggle. So the only place where we have the beginnings of a nitrogen cycle and no full completion and the production of ammonia without the presence of this bacteria is modern human skin. So it's a really interesting data, data point there. Um, this bacteria, not surprisingly, ends up being very present in natural wastewater management streams because of its sort of balancing effect. But this notion of balance is also really interesting because of our where we started our conversation, actually, around good versus bad bacteria. And this is going to be tough to wrap our minds around, but actually, it's less about making bacteria fall into the good category or the bad category. And it's more about understanding the dynamic in that ecosystem itself. So bacteria are, are not by default of their presence going to be good or bad. It's if the environment enables them to be good or bad. So I'll give a couple of specific examples. Acne, uh, P. acne is the bacteria that was associated and discovered as being the cause to acne. Uh, and so, so many treatments, including today, the first course, is, the first approach that is used by dermatologists is an antibiotic to be able to kill acne-causing bacteria or acne-causing bacteria, P. acnes. Then what was discovered was that you, you yourself, you probably have P. acne on your skin, and yet your skin looks flawless from what I'm able to tell on this screen here. Thank you. No hash so, hashtag no filter. <laughs> hashtag no filter. So there was this question that emerged of, okay, well, why does that person who has really great skin and also has P. acne, and then this person that has acne and also has P. acne on their skin, what is the actual difference between these two people? And it turns out that the answer has more to do with that ecosystem than it does with the presence or absence of this bacteria. So when we bring it back to this idea of balance and why we call this the peacekeeper bacteria is because when we reintroduce this bacteria to an ecosystem or like in that study that we did where we swabbed people's skin throughout the course of this experiment, we see that their entire ecosystem starts to shift. It starts to shift into a more balanced state so that it is better able to take care of itself. It doesn't create the opportunity for bacteria that could potentially present problems to start to cause problems. So this is where it goes back to this idea of balance and peacekeeping um, and helping keep things uh, in check. Right, got it. 
Okay, awesome. Uh, so just, I have one more question. I swear this is the last. Uh, so you have on, on Mother Dirt, you have all the products that I've used. So you have the moisturizer, you have the mist, you have the, the shampoo, etc. Now we're talking to people about not excessively using products or excessively yep. washing or anything. For the general person, such as myself, how often should I be using a moisturizer? Should it be after every time that I've washed or should it be like once a day? And uh, the same with the other products, I guess. Sure. As often as you need it. Uh, so the Got rest it. of our products are there as optional. Uh, they are not anything that is required. If you're going to start with any one product in our routine, definitely start with the mist. The other products are there as easy swaps into your existing routine. So if you are interested in swapping out your current cleanser, if you're using one for our cleanser because it's biome friendly and it'll help cultivate uh, the ammonia oxidizing bacteria on your skin, then absolutely go for it. Um, are you pegged to them? Are you required to use them? Absolutely not. And then back to our own product philosophy, if you're already a person that's using minimal to no soap or you have found that you barely need to shampoo your hair and some people don't need to use shampoo at all. We are not saying that in order for you to be clean and healthy that you now need to start using our products. We do believe you should start using the mist um, because you're probably missing that bacteria. Um, so that product is, is a little bit different, but it is all up to your own personal, uh, personal preference. Got it. Okay. Well, what I do suggest is that people, uh, if you have all your products at home and you don't know if it's actually healing you or harming you, maybe have an app such as Think Dirty, download it and you can scan it and you can see uh, actually what's in that product. And if it's a promotional purchase, then buyer beware. You know? <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, just want to finish off by saying thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Now, you are going to be giving the listeners 20% off. Okay, and this doesn't matter where you are in the world. 20% off at checkout from Mother Dirt. And I'll put the link in the show, show notes uh, by using DIGIN, D-I-G-I-N, as your code at checkout. And for everybody else within the U.S., you can get 20% off and free shipping. That's great for domestic users. And uh, so uh, the, the, the code for that is free ship, F-R-E-E-S-H-I-P-20. So thank you very much for providing that uh, to our listeners uh, today. Yeah, of course. And uh, thank you ever so much for giving me this hour of your precious time because I know you're exceptionally <laughs> busy and I'm sure our listeners are going to have something great and could be a new step forward uh, for their own health. So uh, yeah, thanks. thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was really great to chat through, and you asked really fantastic questions. I hope people find it useful. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, everybody, that's a Knowledge and Mileage podcast. Until next week, we are out.